Puis on veut faire aussi une analyse des coûts de production associés. Puis le troisième point dans notre vitrine, c'est vraiment de, de documenter là, la rentabilité du, euh, du chauffage minimal. Donc le, oops, le but euh, de la, du webinaire aujourd'hui, c'est malheureusement pas de vous présenter les résultats, mais euh, sachez qu'ils vont être disponibles ailleurs dans d'autres contextes là, euh, éventuellement. Donc la vitrine, comment qu'elle s'est construite, c'est ça. Bien, on a trois structures alignables, comme je l'ai dit tantôt, mais on, on a aussi des essais Alitac Saint-Hyacinthe menés par les étudiants de José Bonneville. Euh, puis, on a aussi des suivis en entreprise qui sont réalisés par les intervenants MAPAC, puis par les agronomes, entre autres, de BioAction. Donc, on suit la ferme du coq à de Bury en Estrie, euh, le jardin des funambules en Estrie aussi, la ferme des quatre temps en Montérégie, la ferme de la coulée douce dans Chaudière-Appalaches, euh, la ferme de Chapeau-Melon en Outaouais, puis tout récemment, le, le, le jardin du village euh, en Gaspésie. Donc, euh, si vous êtes intéressé à en savoir plus sur le projet ou si, par exemple, euh, vous planifiez vous construire une serre bientôt, sachez qu'on a quelques documents de référence pour vous. Entre autres, euh, un vidéo sur le montage des serres du CETAB qui a été mis en ligne sur le YouTube du CETAB. Ça survole les grandes étapes là, impliquées dans la construction d'une serre, donc je vous invite à aller voir ça. Sinon, le 16 décembre prochain, euh, on fait une visite ouverte à tous des serres du, du CETAB avec les essais. Euh, par contre, c'est limité à 50 inscriptions, puis je pense qu'il en reste seulement une dizaine, donc il euh, faut, faut se dépêcher pour ça. Puis sinon aussi, il va y avoir euh, un deuxième webinaire cet hiver dont la date va être à confirmer. Euh, le, la date va être affichée là, en fait sur le site du CETA puis le Facebook du CETA, du CETA donc restez à l'affût pour ça. Puis aussi, on va sortir des fiches techniques sur les quatre cultures à l'essai euh, seulement à l'automne 2022. Il faut être patient pour ça, mais je pense qu'il va y avoir beaucoup de matériel intéressant là-dedans. Euh, sinon, aujourd'hui, euh, le webinaire euh, s'adresse vraiment à un public général, à des euh, non-initiés de la culture hivernale. On s'adresse moins à des producteurs expérimentés, donc sachez-le en partant. On peut toujours apprendre des nouvelles choses d'un autre producteur, mais vraiment, on visait une introduction générale de la culture hivernale. Là, euh, tandis que le deuxième webinaire à l'hiver va être vraiment plus, euh, va vraiment plus toucher à des points précis, soit la gestion climatique et tout ça pour des producteurs expérimentés. Euh, voilà, sinon un mot sur euh, PAM. En fait, c'est une productrice agricole depuis euh, plus de 30-40 ans euh, dans l'État de Virginie. C'est aussi l'autrice du livre de Year Round Hoop House. C'est pour ça qu'on l'a invité en fait à le produire un vraiment beau document de référence euh, sur la production euh, en serre froide euh, à l'année. Et euh, voilà. Sinon, c'est ça. Il faut, faut reconnaître les limites aussi de, de, de la transférabilité des résultats. PAM est, comme je l'ai dit, dans l'État de Virginie, donc quand même plus chaud qu'au Québec. Euh, puis aussi, la, 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 la serre dans laquelle est produit, en fait, la ferme sur laquelle est produit, c'est pas nécessairement à vocation commerciale, c'est plus pour euh, nourrir la communauté intentionnelle du village de Twin Oaks. Donc, c'est des, des éléments à tenir en compte quand on écoute sa présentation. Toutefois, je pense qu'on peut quand même absorber plein d'informations quant aux cultures qui sont cultivées puis au potentiel dans, la, dans, la, dans sa serre froide. Donc, euh, voilà. Sinon, euh, je laisserai la place aux vidéos. Puis, comme je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, vous pouvez euh, tout au long du vidéo euh, afficher vos questions dans le chat puis on les posera à Pam à la fin de la présentation qui dure quand même une cinquantaine de minutes. Là. Donc, euh, voilà. À tout à l'heure. Hello, my name is Pam Dawling. Welcome to the workshop on hoop house cold season vegetable production. I'm the author of two books, Sustainable Market Farming and the Year Round Hoop House. And I have a website, sustainablemarketfarming.com. I do a blog post there once a week. You can go there and browse, or you can sign up to get the posts sent to your email, or you can see it through Facebook. I live and farm in Twin Oaks community in central Virginia. We're located on Monacan land, and we're in USDA cold hardiness zone 7A. Our last frost date is around 30th of April, and our first frost date is around 14th of October. 
And our goal is to feed our intentional community of 100 people year round with a wide range of organic vegetables. If you want to know more about the community, there's a website, twinoaks.org, and you can read about us there. But today here, I'm just going to talk about our vegetables. Uh, here's an idea of what my climate is like. Yours is on the next slide. You can get this information on weatherspark.com. And here you can see our average high and low temperatures. The red line is the average high, the blue line is the average low, and the shaded areas show the range. So our usual temperatures at Twin Oaks are between minus two and 32 Celsius, rarely below minus 15 or above 36. And on the 21st of December, the winter solstice, we have about nine and a half hours of daylight and our frost-free period is almost seven months. And now here's what I think your climate is like. So same kind of thing. Your normal temperatures are between minus 15 and 26, rarely below minus 24 or above 30. Uh, and on the winter solstice, you have eight and a half hours of daylight and your frost-free period is almost six months. So you see, I have a bit more daylight and a bit less frost than you do and mm, higher temperatures on the whole. But you can fit in exactly your location and this website and get very interesting information. So what is a hoop house? It's a structure of metal bows or uh, arcs covered with polyethylene, either one layer or two. It must be resistant to UV light, don't buy regular polyethylene. Um, the double layered hoop houses give, um, are, are kept inflated. Between the two layers is air from a small blower. And this will um, provide insulation um, about five Celsius degrees different at night in the winter from outside. It also offers resistance to strong winds and heavy snow. If you don't have electricity, you might look into a product called solar wrap. Uh, if you just have a one layer hoop house, I don't recommend this. Uh, and it's not much warmer at night in the winter than outdoors. Uh, and you will need floating row covers inside the hoop house. Usually, as you can maybe see in the background photo, the crops are grown directly in the ground. So it's just like having a little garden with a cover. Here's our hoop house at Twin Oaks. We have a double layer of plastic, uh, Gothic arch style. You can see the shape of the roof in the photo. It's nine by 29 meters, and it's a farm tech clear span model. We put it up in 2003 with the goal of growing winter greens and also earlier tomatoes and peppers. And in order to maximize the growing space, uh, we made five beds 120 centimeters wide with 60 centimeter beds at the edges. And this left us just narrow 30 centimeter paths. Now that was our choice. You can make a different choice if you like. Uh, here's an overview of winter hoop house. Uh, we plant a lot of different vegetables. You can see some in the photo. Um, we want to eat these between, we plant them, sorry, between in September and October, and we harvest them right through the winter until April and May. And um, without any inner row covers, um, we have had lettuces survive when it's been minus 10 Celsius outdoors. And if we think it's going to be below minus 14, we will add row covers for the night. And then with those row covers, we've had lettuces survive when it was minus 24 outside. So you can see, you can keep vegetables alive a lot colder than you might have thought. And also the quality is really, really nice. In the red box on the screen, you can see a little screen icon and information about another slideshow. 
There's a website, slideshare.net, and um, most of my slideshows are posted there. You can go there, put my name, Pam Dawling, in the search box, and you will see little icons for the slideshows that I have available. They are all in English, and you don't hear me talking, but you can watch them at your own pace with a dictionary, and they are all free. So the advantages of our winter hoop house. Um, we are just amazed at how productive the hoop house is. And the quality is really wonderful. And the rate of growth um, is, is really nice. Um, and much, the quality is much better. And the plants can tolerate colder temperatures than they can outdoors, partly because the soil stays warmer and the roots can grow deeper and bigger. And working in a hoop house in the winter is so much nicer than working outdoors when it's cold with mini tunnels that are frozen and frozen fingers. So you want to choose cold resistant vegetables. Coming up in this slideshow, I have a winter kill temperature chart. It's also in your handout, I forgot to say. There's a PDF handout that goes with this presentation. And all the charts and tables are on there. And you can um, look at those whenever you like. <laughs> so uh, that will be coming up next. Also, it helps if you choose varieties that are most resistant to cold. Uh, in our hoop house, we grow some crops which would not survive outdoors. We also grow some which do, and we also grow them outdoors, but the ones in the hoop house grow faster and are better quality than the ones outdoors. So here's the start of my winter kill temperature. Uh, these are temperatures outdoors without any extra row cover. Um, so you can allow for whatever kind of crop protection you can provide. You might get different results, and if you do, let me know. This is a work in progress. I update this list every year in the spring with anything new that I learned the previous winter. So in our double layer hoop house, remember it's going to be five Celsius warmer than outdoors at night. Plants can survive eight Celsius colder than they can outdoors without adding any row cover. If you add row cover, I mean good thick row cover, 42 grams, uh, the plants can survive at least 12 degrees Celsius colder than outdoors. So I'm not going to read the whole list. You can see it on your handout. I'm just going to pick out some um, special features. <laughs> um, so at minus, I'm not, warmer than minus four is just chilly. At minus four, some of the Asian greens will die outdoors. Maruba Santo, Mizuna, most Pak Choi, Tokyo Bacana. Uh, some of the scallions will die, green onions. But there are some varieties that are much more cold resistant. And we'll come to those. As it gets colder, uh, minus six. The uh, multicolored Swiss chard will die, such as bright lights or rainbow. Um, the green ones and the red ones are more cold hardy. Um, moving along, you'll notice that it really depends on the variety for quite a few vegetables. And if you go to my website and look for the most recent version of this winter kill list, you'll be able to see some variety names. Um, okay, the flat-leafed parsley will die at minus 7, but the curly parsley won't die until minus 9.5. So that is worth noting. Maybe you love flat parsley, but the curly one will survive the cold. Also at minus 5, red chard will die. Moving down to colder temperatures, um, minus 11, this is when carrots die. 
um, minus 12 uh, covered beets. Um, what do I want to pick out from here? Uh, the leaves of Sen Po Sai, which I'm going to show you, it's an Asian green. The leaves will die at minus 12. This is quite cold hardy plant. The main plant may survive that down to minus 13. Also, um, the curly leafed savoyed spinach is more cold hardy than most of the smooth leafed or flat leafed kinds. I think somewhere in here I have missed um, the green chard because I'm reading this in French. <laughs> uh, so the, the green chard is more hardy than the red, which is more hardy than the multicolored. So moving along here, some leeks are good down to minus 18. You probably wouldn't, well, you might grow those in your hoop house. You certainly could. Also, here's the temperature of the more hardy green onions, scallions. Evergreen, hardy white, and white Lisbon are much more cold hardy than some other. Um, varieties. Also, there are some spinach varieties which are hardy to minus 18. And this is outdoor temperatures, remember. So it's going to be a much better situation in a double hoop house or a single hoop house with row cover if you make a choice. And then it gets really, really cold. I don't know about these temperatures. These are colder than I have experienced. So this is information um, that I have heard. <laughs> so use this table to decide which crops to grow, which varieties, and when to harvest them. If you see it's going to get much colder than it's already been, you might harvest a lot of one particular crop. Next, I'm going to talk about salad crops. Growing salads in winter in a hoop house is so easy and so efficient, it's just wonderful. Uh, lettuces are able to freeze each night and then thaw each morning without damage. And um, you can also use a baby salad, baby lettuce mix, which is more cold hardy than big lettuces. And it's very easy to grow. Just make sure you sow it early enough that it has time to grow before it gets very cold. Also for salads, there are a lot of cooking greens, which you can use when they're small. So if you sow the seed in the ground in your hoop house, you can thin the rows, take out some of the plants to um, make salad in the meantime. There are lettuces, winter lettuces, which survive cold. Here in this photo on the right, one of my favorite varieties, Tango, the green frilly one. I think the dark red one beyond it is Buckley, but I'm not certain. On the left, there's a, a Romaine photo bombing, one, another of my favorite winter varieties, red tinged winter. So these are both very cold hardy. I've got a list coming up, which is in your handout. Um, we transplant big lettuces. Well, they're not big when we transplant. Um, we transplant those in October and we harvest the leaves all winter from the same plants. This helps you have lots and lots of harvest. We also will sow the baby lettuce mix several times between October and mid-February to harvest whenever they reach 10 centimeters tall. You want to avoid sowing when it's really, really cold. So have your transplants in place ready to harvest. Here's the list of cold hardy winter varieties of lettuce. This is on the handout. I've tested all these ones. <laughs> the ones which are bold are the best of all. Buckley, Green Forest, Hampton, Red Tinged Winter, Revolution, Tango, and Winter Marvel. But these are all good in a hoop house in our climate. But if you, it's colder, you might start with these ones in bold. Here's two kinds of small lettuces. On the left is a baby lettuce mix. Um, you cut these whenever they reach 10 centimeters tall above the growing point so that they can regrow. And then um, while they're regrowing, we will take leaves from our big lettuces and give these a chance to regrow. As you can see, lots of pretty colors. 
On the right is a fairly new kind of crop, a small leafed lettuce. Johnny's seeds has Salanova. High mowing has one cut or easy leaf. And there's also a few varieties that have been around for a while. Tango, Oscard and Panisse. And they have this growing habit of making more and more leaves the same sort of size, small to medium. The outer leaves do not become enormous. So you have choices about how to harvest these interesting lettuces. You can cut the whole plant and, and sell that if you like. It's an expensive way to grow head lettuce, but they do have some nice varieties. Or you can do, as in this photograph, harvest the whole plant, cut out the core, and you have an instant bag or bowl full of small to medium sized leaves. Or my recommendation, do as we do, grow these plants all winter and just harvest the outer leaves and the plants will stay alive, tasting good all winter. They're not going to get bitter. They're not going to bolt in the winter. Another salad crop we grow is a mix of brassicas, um, which we cut small, around 10 centimeters, same as the lettuce mix. Uh, you can buy mixes or uh, you can make your own. <laughs> we often make our own using leftover seeds that we're not going to grow again or the germination rate is maybe not so good. It's a bit of a risk, but uh, with the brassica mixes or mustard mixes, as they're sometimes called, uh, you don't get as many cuts as you can with the baby lettuce mix because these will start to bolt when it gets past the past a few cuts. You do want to avoid um, turnips and radishes and mustards that have um, bristly, spiny leaves. They're not very nice for salads. We sow these between the 2nd of October and the 14th of November to harvest during the winter and between the 4th of December and the 12th of February to harvest in March and the beginning of April. Uh, this crop at the front of the photograph is Mizuna, also known as Kayona. Uh, it's a very, it's an Asian green. It uh, adds volume to mixes, salad mixes, because of the fern-like frilly shape. Um, it has a mild flavor and thin sort of juicy white stems. It's available in green or purple, but uh, purple Mizuna we find a bit disappointing and we would rather grow ruby streaks, which is on the next slide. Uh, you can sow this and use it for baby salads when it's just 21 days old, or you can let it get bigger, take out the thinnings, put those in your salad mix, and then it will reach maturity in about 40 days. And um, you want to thin them out to 20 to 30 centimeters spacing. It will regrow very vigorously after you cut it. And it's very easy to grow. It tolerates cold, damp soil. And uh, it's cold hardy down to minus four. And a little bit warm tolerant when you get to spring. Uh, on the right here is ruby streaks that I mentioned. These are, we call them frilly mustards or sometimes just frills. <laughs> There's a lot of these available now. A lot of different curly shapes and colors. The one in the middle, golden frills, is very pungent and has a very interesting leaf shape. The one on the left is red splendor. There's scarlet frills, red rain. Uh, we've grown a lot of different ones. There are also small salad greens, uh, such as arugula. Cold hardy varieties include Silvetta, Surrey, Astro, and Evenstar. There are also uh, Parsley, which we mentioned, uh, Belle Isle Cress, um, Claytonia, um, lots of other small crops. Uh, they are all very, these ones are very old, very resistant to cold, um, but they are small plants and they grow slowly. This is great if you value them because you have a long winter and you want some different crops to eat or they're valuable if you're selling to restaurants who will pay you well 
for the extra time it takes for the small and the small yield you get. But where I live, these are not worthwhile for us. We would rather use the space for more spinach, kale and lettuce. Those, are, those grow well all winter where we are and that's what people want to eat. So we don't grow the small ones anymore, but you might. Spinach is a good crop to grow in the hoop house because you can use it for a salad or for cooking and it grows very well. Uh, it can be difficult to germinate um, in the autumn if the soil is still warm. So you might have to wait, for, use a soil thermometer and see when the temperature goes down enough. Um, or if you're in a hurry, <laughs> as we often are, you can sprout the seed for a week in the fridge. And that, that works well. Um, what else do I need to say? Oh, another good thing to know about spinach is it will make some growth whenever the temperature is warmer than five. So in your hoop house, it's going to be above five quite a lot. Any sunny day, it's going to grow some. And um, we grow different varieties. Uh, for November and December, we like renegade. It's a smooth-leafed spinach, and generally we prefer the Savoid. But this one makes good growth for November and December. And then we switch over to Acadia or Escalade, and they do well between January and April for us. And then after that, um, we well, in January, we will sow Reflect for the spring harvest because it's more resistant to bolting. Um, in our hoop house, we grow these Russian kales, like you see in the photo. They're easy to grow. And Russian kales, they, these are Napas varieties. They grow more quickly during the cold months of low light uh, compared to the Oleracea kales like Vates or Blue Scotch Curled. Outdoors, we grow Vates because it can survive colder temperatures, but it's kind of dormant. It doesn't make a lot of growth when it's cold. Uh, here in the photo on the left, we've got red Russian. That's the south side. And then we've got the white Russian, which grows a bit bigger. Uh, red Russian will bolt before the white. Um, what else do I need to say? Oh, yeah, we sow this September 24th, and we harvest from 8th of December. So your dates will probably be a bit different. Uh, on the right of these Russian kales, you can see black magic kale. We've tried this and it doesn't work for us, but I think it might work well for you. Uh, I've, I've got friends in Massachusetts that grow it in the summer as well as the winter, and it's very tasty. But for us, it didn't develop good flavor and it um, housed a lot of aphids. Swiss chard is another great cooking green. Um, it's easy to germinate, will germinate in warmer conditions than spinach will. And here's an interesting aspect of growing in the winter. Uh, we do two sowings of Swiss chard. The first one on the 15th of September, and we can harvest that for cooking from 15th of November to the 10th of May. So it's 61 days from sowing to first harvest. We do a second sowing on the 26th of October, and we can't start harvesting that for cooking until the 6th of February, which is 103 days later. This is because after the 26th of October, we have November and December and January, and not much happens. Uh, both sowings will only last until the 10th of May, when it will be so hot they will bolt. Uh, there's a lot of really nice Asian greens that you can use for cooking. You can also use many of them for salads if you like that sort of thing. Um, they, uh, they grow quickly. Um, there's a whole range, a big range of attractive varieties in different colors, different shapes. Some are more uh, spicy flavored than others. But the big secret is they're very easy to grow. You just treat them like you would grow kale. All of them, all the same, and you get a whole variety of different harvests. Uh, these do particularly well in our hoop house in Zone 7A. Uh, maybe 
for you, I would suggest starting with the most cold, hardy ones. They're not going to flower. They're not going to bolt in the autumn or the winter. Uh, once you get to spring, or even before spring, really, early, <laughs> early spring, late winter, um, in January, Tatsoi Maruba Santo Tokyo Bacana that you sowed in the autumn will bolt then. So make sure to harvest before you get to that. And then in February, for us, the Napa cabbage and the pak choy. For you, I think the dates will be a little later. Then March and April, we get Yukina Savoy, Senpo Sai, Komatsuna, Mizuna, and Leaf Radish will all bolt then. I have a whole slideshow about Asian greens. There's a lot, a lot to learn and benefit from. Here's some pictures of some Asian greens that I, well, I like most of these. <laughs> the first one on the top left is Sen Po Sai. It's very resistant to cold. I'll tell you more about it in a minute. The ones that are in bold are the most cold resistant. Uh, moving to the right, number two is Pak Choi, which is one of the Asian greens that non-Asian people are more familiar with. Uh, below that is Komatsuna. It's a very cold resistant one. It also grows in a sort of vertical uh, shape habit. Um, so it's good to get lots of plants in a small space. Below that is chrysanthemum greens. It is actually a chrysanthemum. It's not a brassica. It has a strong chrysanthemum flavor. It's a love it or hate it vegetable. So try a few before you try a lot. The small thin vegetable in the middle is yokatana or vitamin green. This is a small plant. It grows maybe um, oh, 25 centimeters tall. Uh, you can plant them close together, maybe 10 centimeters. So it's another one if you want to get lots of plants in a small space. In the bottom left is tatsoi, which is cold resistant and very beautiful. And above that is um, ruby streaks, which we already met. It's there as a representative of that whole family of frilly mustards. I have some more pictures on the next slide. And we've already seen the mustard mixes and Mizuna. Uh, if you want big, strong, sturdy greens, uh, Ms. Spooner and Tora Zero are two examples. Uh, there's also a small um, Honsai Thai, which is like broccoli rabe. You might like that. Here's some others that I recommend. Uh, top left is Napa cabbage. Moving to the right, we have Yukina Savoy and Tatsoi, but these pictures are misleading on scale. The Yukina Savoy is bigger than the Tatsoi. To the right of them is the adolescent Pak Choi plant. Uh, below that is the Chinese horned mustard, which is very cold hardy. Moving to the left is Tokyo Bacana. Maruba Santo is very similar. These are uh, delicate leaves. You can use them in place of lettuce. You can also cook with them. Don't cook for long. Uh, they grow very quickly. Th these are good ones to have. And then to the left of that is a uh, Mizuna. And if you look closely, you can see this one is making uh, flowers. This is the end of April. And right in the middle of the screen is Scarlet Frills, another of those frilly mustards. Beautiful, dark color. Now I want to tell you about Sen Po Sai, my, my favorite. <laughs> uh, it's very resistant to cold and also somewhat to heat. It's very, very productive. It grows quickly. It has big, round, green leaves. And they, frankly, they look boring. This is not a boring crop at all. So transplant 30 to 45 centimeters apart. I said it will grow big. It takes only 40 days to maturity. I said it grows fast. And it's, it's not going to make a head. So you want to harvest, just take the bigger leaves. Um, it regrows quickly. Uh, it cooks quickly. And it has a delicious flavor that's a sweet cabbage-y flavor and a tender texture. It's a cross between Komatsuna and a regular cabbage. So it's really easy, really delicious, really productive. Can't praise it more highly. <laughs> Moving on to talk about uh, root crops. Here we have turnips. They do very well in the hoop house and the greens are also very edible. So you get two crops 
from one plant, the roots and the leaves. We sow turnips on the 15th of October, which is round about our first frost date, and we harvest them from the 4th of December. We make a second sowing between the 24th of October and 9th of November, and a small third one around about 10th of December. The varieties we like include Red Round, Scarlet Ono Revival, which is the top photo here, Hakare, Oasis, and White Egg. White Egg is the lower photo here. Hakare is the pop star turnip. <laughs> it's very delicious, very tender, but it's the least cold tolerant of all, mostly perhaps because the root is almost entirely sitting on the soil surface. So don't grow this one if it's cold where you are. Uh, if, it's, if you are worried about the cold, you might first of all try whatever turnip you grow outdoors and see how that does, and then try these more tender ones. Uh, beetroot, beets, as another root crop that grow very well in a hoop house. They're easy to germinate, except uh, in the autumn, if it's still hot, <laughs> you might need to cool the soil down by watering and covering with a shade cloth. Um, you can uh, pre-sprout the seed uh, if you want to uh, get an earlier start, and then you need to sow by hand. We grow bull's blood beets for the beautiful dark red leaves, which we cut and use in salad mix. And we have also grown cylindra, which is a large cylindrical beet, <laughs> um, a very tender, um, a delicious flavor. Here we have carrots. Um, we don't actually grow carrots in our hoop house because we can easily grow them outdoors and then store them in bulk. But people that do grow them in their hoop house uh, say how wonderful the sweet flavor is in the winter. My reluctance is because they take a long time to grow, uh, but that might not matter to you if you really like the flavor. Here we have radishes. On the left, we have the large um, winter radishes. Uh, we I would sow these in August or September. You don't want to be too early, otherwise they will um, make flowers before you get to the winter. Uh, so we grow, we grow them. They are big. You get a big harvest. They store easily in plastic bags under refrigeration. You can use them for all kinds of things. You can grate them in salads, cut thin slices or matchsticks or you can cut cubes and use them uh, in a stew, or you can make pickles like kimchi. Over on the right, we have the small radishes. We like Easter egg and white icicle, especially cherry bell for the first sowing. Uh, we've had trouble with cherry bell becoming too fibrous, and sparkler is always too fibrous for, our, for us. Um, in the photograph, you see Easter egg. It's actually a mix. So we get red, white, pink, plum, purple colors, and they're not all ready on the same day. For us, this is an advantage. We walk along the row and take the biggest ones, come back a few days later and take some more big ones. Um, we like that. We also like having different colors. <laughs> the other radish we really like is white icicle, which is a bit like a small daikon, um, maybe 10 centimeters long but more crunchy, juicy than a daikon. We will sow small radishes six times between the 6th of September and the 26th of January. After that, it's too late to grow them in our hoop house. Uh, they will take 27 to 52 days to maturity, um, not counting days when it's too cold for them to grow at all. We'll come back to that when I tell you about succession planting. Uh, onions on the left, we've got the scallions, the green onions. Uh, we grow three sowings of these. 6th of September that we can harvest from the 1st of December to 1st of March. And then two follow-up sowings, 20th of October, 18th of November, that we can harvest uh, in the spring. 
Evergreen Hardy White in White Lisbon, a very cold hardy. Uh, over on the right, we have bulbing onions. You can grow these to maturity in your hoop house if you like. Um, we have sown them in November in our hoop house in, to transplant them outdoors in the spring. Um, that also that works very well for us. It helps us get bigger onions. Um, here we are trying to grow big bulbing onions in front of peppers. It was a bit too much shade for the peppers. Um, garlic scallions are another wonderful crop. They're actually small, whole garlic plants. Um, they taste wonderful and they look attractive. They come in, you can harvest them during what we call the hungry gap, which is the period in spring when your supplies of stored vegetables might dwindle down and new crops are not yet ready. Uh, they have very strong flavor, so if you're selling them, a little bunch of three to six is plenty for most people. <laughs> garlic scallions also bring in the garlic flavor during a time when maybe you don't have any bulb garlic left. Uh, you can plant either small cloves left over from ones that you wouldn't try to grow a bulb from, or you can plant whole small bulbs of garlic, the ones that you don't want to peel. <laughs> you can stick them in the ground, they all grow. If you plant a whole bulb, you get a bunch growing right together. Um, some growers have said that uh, you might make more money growing garlic scallions than you can from bulbs of garlic. Uh, here we have some cold climate legumes. Um, the photo on the left is Sugar Anne, snack peas. We sow these on the 1st of February. That's one month earlier than we would sow them outdoors. Once you get past the uh, winter solstice, anything that you would plant outdoors, you can plant one month earlier in your hoop house. On the right, we have a photo of fava beans or broad beans. We sowed these in the 15th of November and we harvested them in the middle of May. This is not a good crop for Virginia. It may be a really good crop where you are, although they're tall, so they make some shade. So you want to have them to the north. Um, I'm from the UK. We grow these beans uh, and get lots and lots of harvests from them in the spring. But Virginia is the wrong climate and here we only get one harvest in the middle of May, and then the plants stop making flowers. So it doesn't work as a hoop house crop for us. Uh, here's another idea, which is growing transplants uh, for the spring. You direct sow the seeds in the ground. We do this on the 24th of January, and then we transplant them outdoors when they're big enough. Uh, this saves you time and money uh, compared to growing plants in um, cell packs. It also can save you space in a, a warmer greenhouse. These plants don't need warm temperatures. They grow very strong. They have a lot of depth of soil for the roots and they don't dry out quickly, so they're easy to look after. We do this with kale, collards and spinach. We sow them all in late January and we transplant in March. Uh, you don't need a lot of hoop house space to get a lot of kale, as you can see from the picture. So those are the crops. Moving on now to uh, planning to keep your hoop house full. You want to think about, first of all, what you want to grow, what people will eat, <laughs> and then um, make a a harvest calendar. Before you make the planting calendar, start with harvest. Think about what you want to harvest when, uh, how often, uh, over what length of time, and in what quantity and how many times in total. And then write down those dates and quantities. And then to work back to figure out what to plant, I recommend adding 10% margin, especially if you are new at this. Uh, to allow for things going wrong. Uh, so when you think about how much, add 10%. Uh, 
Also think about germination temperatures. Make sure that the crop you want to grow can germinate at the temperature you have. You don't want to waste your time or your space sowing seeds that have no chance of germination. Also find out how many days it's going to take for your seeds to germinate under the conditions you have so that you know when to re-sow if you need to. Use a soil thermometer and consult tables of temperatures of germination. I have one in my book, The Year Round Hoop House. And another feature, another factor to consider in working out when to plant is the number of days to maturity. So get the number from the catalog uh, and then make sure you know if it is from seed to harvest or transplanting to harvest. And then you're going to work back from your harvest dates for each crop, subtracting the number of days to maturity to find out when to plant. But there are some more things to think about. Days to maturity in the catalogs are usually for ideal spring conditions and you are not growing in ideal spring conditions. So add 14 days uh, for the slower rate of growth. And then if, when the temperature is less than four Celsius, they're not going to grow. So if you can figure out how many days that might be from the Weather Spark website, um, you can add those in just as dead time. <laughs> not dead, but not growing. Uh, also, days to maturity often means days to first harvest. Um, which is not the same as days to full harvest. So if you're growing carrots, it doesn't matter exactly what size they are when you harvest. But if you want to grow um, Napa cabbage, it really does matter if they've formed a big head or not. If you need 24 big cabbages, it's no good if you only have one. So add seven days. The next thing to think about is what we call the Persephone days. They're given this name by Elliot Coleman. This is the period when the daylight is less than 10 hours and um, not a lot of growing happens. And the dates depend on your latitude. I'm at 38 degrees north, so the period is from the 20th of November to the 20th of January. You can get the numbers uh, almost certainly on WeatherSpark, but also uh, any um, weather forecast website. Uh, in Quebec, 47 north, uh, your Persephone days are 1st of November to 8th of February. Um, but the period of uh, least growth is also influenced by the time it takes for the soil to cool down and to warm up again. And for us, um, the dates of least growth are 15th of December to the 15th of February. So that's a time lag of uh, 25 days, but it's still the same length of time. So in order to harvest in the middle of the winter, you want to plan so that you have enough crops in place um, for the slow growth period. Um, we do this by planning several of the uh, heading Asian greens, the large uh, one such as the Napa cabbage and the Pak Choi and Yukino Savoy and uh, Tokyo Bacana. And then we will be able to harvest those during the Persephone days, which will leave the um, leaf harvest crops longer to recover. So next you want to make your planting schedule. So for each crop, uh, write down the first possible planting date and the last date that's worthwhile to plant. And then um, think about, uh, work back to find your planting date and make a planting calendar in date order. And then think about when that crop is going to be finished and what you could grow immediately following. Here's a piece of our planting schedule. We have a column where we write down what date we did the work and we have a column where we show when we plan to do the work, but 
sometimes plans don't materialize exactly. Then we have a column for the bed where we're planting, whether we're sowing or transplanting, the row length, the row spacing, the number of rows. And if we're transplanting, we will write in the plant space. And then we write down the crop and the variety. And then we have a notes column for any information about planting. And then two columns, harvest start and harvest finish. And initially, you won't know the answer to this. But when you find out, write it down so that next year you'll know. And then we have a column with success where we will write down after the crop has happened whether it was a success or, or if not, why not. Uh, next, I want to talk about using the space to the maximum. You want to keep the space filled with useful crops. Uh, this is because it, this is such valuable space and uh, it's such uh, so rewarding to grow there that you want to use it fully. So it's important to know when your crops will be finished or when they will bolt. In other words, when you need to be sure to have finished harvesting them. Uh, so I'm going to talk about four different techniques for keeping the space full. First of all, transplanting from outside in the autumn, um, replacing, uh, oh, filling the dead time. I'm not sure what that means in English. Um, uh, interplanting and succession planting. We'll figure that out in a minute. So first of all, um, we sow outdoors in the autumn to transplant inside a month or so, two to four weeks later. This helps us use the uh, space in the hoop house to prepare the beds. It gives us, gives us more time. And also the conditions outdoors are actually better in September for these crops than inside. Although we do have to use these insect netting because we have so many insects at that time of year. So on the 15th of September, we sow pak choy, Chinese cabbage, Yukina savoy, Tokyo bacana, Maruba santo, Swiss chard, leaf lettuce, and romains. And on the 24th of September, we sow senposai, kale, mizuna, more lettuces, and more Yukina savoy. And um, we make sure to label everything clearly and water. And then we have this uh, chart of succession crops, which is a sequence of different crops occupying the same space over time. Um, these dates won't exactly work for you, but you can use the principles um, and see, once you know when one crop is going to be finished, you can think about what you could follow it with. I'm not going to read this because, as I say, the dates won't exactly work, and it's on your handout. Uh, we also grow filler greens as well as the planned crops. We sow short rows of spinach, lettuce, and some of the Asian greens. That's what you see in this photograph. Uh, Senpo Sai, Yukina Savoy, Maruba Santo. And the goal here is to use these plants to fill gaps, even one, you know, one at a time or a few, as soon as something has been removed. Um, this is really easy for us, just it doesn't take a lot of space, but if you prefer, you could grow them in plug flats. Uh, if we don't end up needing these, um, as you can see, the ones nearer the camera have got a bit big for transplanting. You can just eat them as they are. Uh, in the spring, we don't clear the whole beds of the winter crops. We clear the rows in the middle first, and then we transplant our tomatoes, peppers, squash, cucumber. Um, this leaves some outer rows of salad mixes which we can continue to harvest for another month. So this gives us greens at a time of year, salad or cooking greens, at a time of year when it's hard to find them. <laughs> um, also, the outer rows of greens will give a little bit of protection for the tender crops which we've transplanted in the middle. We put row cover over these at night if it's cold, and the 
salad crops help hold up the row cover. Uh, this is a chart on your handout, a succession of plantings uh, during the cold period. So we do two each of Swiss chard, Tatsoi, Yukina Savoy, three each of Mizuna, green onions, um, frilly mustards, turnips and onions for outdoors, four each of baby lettuce and the brassica salad mix, and five each of spinach and radish. Some of this will have changed a little bit and once again, the exact dates won't work, but this will give you an idea. You'll probably start earlier than we would start and go later. Now I want to tell you about succession planting for continuous harvests. Uh, this is very much the short version of this topic, but I do have a whole slideshow on SlideShare about this if you want to get more details. So in order to get harvests at regular intervals from successive patches of a crop, you need to vary the interval between the sowing date of the first one and the second one and so on. Um, when the temperature and the um, day length decrease in autumn, the time to maturity gets longer, uh, which which means that if you're a day late sowing something in the autumn, it can cause a delay of a week in harvest. So be careful of that. <laughs> and then after the winter solstice, when the temperature and the day length start to increase, the time to maturity will decrease. And later sowings will almost catch up with the earlier ones. So um, if you want to pay attention to this, you'll need to write down the planting dates and your harvest dates, starting and finishing. So I'm going to use little radishes as an example. You can make a graph for each crop. You put the sowing date on the horizontal axis, the X axis, and the date of the first harvest on the vertical axis. And um, even if you've only got one day, one year, sorry, of harvest, you can um, use that data, one year of data. Uh, you can use that and your next year you'll have two and that will be better. And so on the graph you mark the first possible date of sowing and the harvest date that goes with that and then decide what's your last worthwhile um, harvest start date and mark that in. And mark in your data and join them all up. You'll find a zigzag line you'll see on the next slide. You want to smooth out this line to be more representative of what might happen. And then you, you count up the number of days from the beginning of the first harvest to the beginning of the last harvest and divide that period up into a whole number of equal segments based on how often you would like to start a new patch of radishes. And then use the graph to see the um, sowing dates you need to match those harvest dates. So here's the graph. As you see, the black line is a very zigzag. This shows that in winter you get some very cold spells and some very strange information. So the goal of the smooth red line is to um, show what might be more typical by evening out the peculiarities. So you want to start with whatever your start point is and end with your end point. And then you should have the same number of points above the line as below. And then um, along the y-axis, the vertical axis, you count up the number of days between the first harvest of the first crop and the first harvest of the last crop and divide by a whole number. Uh, we've got one, two, three, four. We've got five intervals with six sowings there. You draw a blue a line. <laughs> Here they're blue to meet the red curve line and then you drop a line down to the sowing date uh, axis to see when you should sow in order to harvest on that date. And you see it's different. Um, it's a very short period between the first and the second sowing because the rate of growth is slowing down. And it's a very long space between the fifth and the sixth because the, the crops are now growing faster and will catch up. And this really does work. It's, 
And if you really want to make the best use of your space and not be overwhelmed by radishes, this is a good way to do it. Next, I want to talk about the daily tasks in the winter hoop house. Uh, we calculate it once we're past the intensive planting stage, which for us is October. It's about two hours of work each day in the winter. And the main task is harvesting. So this is a real sign of success. Two hours of harvesting. Um, we also we want to keep the temperature in the tunnel between 18 and 27 Celsius during the day. So we'll open up the windows whenever it's more than five outdoors and the doors whenever it's above 10 outdoors in order to keep the indoor temperature in the right range. And then we'll close the windows and the doors several hours before sunset, before dusk, to store some of the heat. You can't store much, but you can store some. Uh, and as well as that, uh, other things include planting new crops, pulling up old ones, spreading compost, um, weeding, watering, uh, that sort of thing. And uh, the challenges, the challenges are in a cold climate are the extreme cold, snow, nitrate accumulation, aphids, and vegetable weevils, and maybe slugs. So when it gets very cold, we have these row covers at the ready. And if it's going to be more than 14 Celsius outdoors, uh, or if we've got the spring crops in there and it's going to freeze, then we will pull these row covers over the crops for the nighttime and then roll them up the next day. So we'll use these this... Uh, kind we like is Taipa, 42 grams a square meter. It's polypropylene. It has a light transmission of 75%, but it doesn't matter at night what the light transmission is, does it? <laughs> it's dark anyway. Uh, it makes, gives, provides about 3.3 Celsius degrees of protection against frost. And it's sturdy. It will last six years or more. And in the hoop house, if you keep special rolls of it for your hoop house, it will last a lot longer because they stay dry and clean. If we need wire hoops, we will make them from six millimeter wire. Snow is heavy and it can be a danger to your hoop house. You don't want your hoop house to collapse. Um, but on the other hand, when you move the snow away, you don't want to make holes in the plastic. So when we have snow, we start on the south side, pulling the snow down to the ground, and this will make some uh, clear patches for the daylight to get in and warm up the indoors. Um, if, if it's still snowing or if, if we get ice frozen on our hoop house, you can't remove ice without damaging the plastic. So if it's frozen or still snowing, we will start inside. We'll take a long broom and we'll hit the, the, the roof and bounce the snow off. Um, each, it, yeah, don't worry about getting all the snow off of the plastic. Every bit you can remove will help warm up the inside, which will then help melt the rest of the snow. Here's a tool for moving snow. These are sold for removing snow from cars. Uh, it's a styrofoam block with a piece of hard plastic in the middle. They're sold with a short handle. So you unscrew the short handle, you buy a long extendable uh, painter's pole and you fasten that in the snow broom and then you can extend it and you can reach way up to the top. You can see in the top picture uh, we've been able to remove the snow on our hoop house. Uh, next, I want to talk about uh, nitrate accumulation. Um, this is something to be aware of if you're con concerned, as I hope we all are, with health. <laughs> uh, we've changed the balance of temperature and light. We've made it warmer in our hoop house, but we haven't made it lighter. And uh, when the light is not very good in the winter, we need to pay attention to raised levels of nitrates in the greens. Um, how this all happens is the plants are absorbing nitrates at night 
and converting them in the daytime into leaves. This is what we call photosynthesis. And it takes about six hours uh, of daytime to use one night's worth of nitrates. Uh, so it's a relatively small amount of winter greens that can hold too much nitrates uh, in the morning. And this is not good for your health. The nitrates can be converted into nitrites in your body, and that reduces the blood's capacity to move oxygen around. And furthermore, the nitrates can be converted into nitrosamines, which are carcinogenic. So be aware of this. And what you can do about it uh, is choose varieties that are best adapted for winter photosynthesis. If they've got the word winter or something similar in the name, that's a good hint. Uh, avoid um, animal manures um, chem and chemical manures, of course, and use biological compost. Make sure your soil has enough phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, molybdenum. Have a good balance. Water enough, but not too much. Uh, make sure to let in fresh air when the temperature reaches 20 Celsius inside. Um, this is so that the level of carbon dioxide will be high enough for the plants. Fresh air. Uh, wait for at least four and preferably six hours of daylight or hopefully sunshine before you harvest the leafy things. Uh, avoid harvesting on, on very overcast days. Although what you harvest from your own hoop house may well be healthier than crops which have spent three days in a truck. Uh, avoid harvesting over mature crops, um, throw away the outer leaves, well, compost the outer leaves. Uh, get your crops under refrigeration immediately after harvesting them and use them soon. And eat a mixed diet. <laughs> Don't just eat uh, turnip greens or kale or spinach. Have a mixed diet. Uh, here are some pests of uh, cold weather conditions in a hoop house. Um, these are ones which we can tell you about. Uh, aphids um, come out. They start <laughs> they start eating <laughs> and reproducing early in spring before their predators have arrived in enough numbers. Um, we will usually need to spray three times with soap, five days intervals. Uh, and then later on, when it warms up a bit more, we can look around and bring in ladybugs. Uh, the second pest that we have trouble with is this one in the drawings and the little photograph. These are the, the larvae of the vegetable weevil larva. It lives in the soil, it comes out at night and bites holes in the leaves of brassicas and spinach. And we will kill these with spinosad. If we find too many holes and too, the health of our plants is suffering, we will spray with spinosad. Um, slugs can be a problem, you can um, pick them by hand. Uh, diseases, this is the worst one, this one in the photo. It's in English called club root. Um, if you get this disease of brassicas, crucifers, um, you can't grow them for 10 years in that soil. So you have to eat a lot of spinach and Swiss chard. Um, there are other illness diseases, uh, fungal ones which affect young plants. We call it damping off disease. Um, if the conditions are cold and damp, um, the little seedlings can die. So uh, sh make sure you don't water too much. Make sure you have enough fresh air. And you can strengthen the plants with sprays of seaweed or compost tea. Uh, here's two more fungal diseases. These ones affect big plants. Um, Rhizoctinia is called bottom rot in English. This is... Uh, a fungal disease, and you don't see it happening because it starts on the base of the leaves, which is usually below a healthy looking lettuce until everything goes wrong. Um, you find uh, rust colored spots and maybe uh, amber colored 
liquid coming out from the plant and then the whole plant will just melt down uh, into a black slime. Um, the second one is the one in the photo, Slerotinia, uh, or lettuce drop. It's another fungal disease. It attacks the base of the leaves at uh, the soil level. You can't see it happening. And then uh, the whole plant collapses down into a pancake, a sort of beige color. It's not particularly wet. It's not slimy like um, Rhizoctinia. It's damp, but not slimy. Uh, both of these problems can be resolved uh, for next year by solarizing. This is uh, solarizing a whole hoop house. So if you decide you're not going to grow any summer crops and you've got bad fungal problems in your lettuce, you can do this. Or if you've got, you know, many, many hoop houses, you lay clear plastic over the soil, you keep the windows and doors closed, you need six warm weeks to kill off the uh, fungal spores. Or you can just solarize one bed. This was my first attempt. Really, it's a picture of how not to solarize. Um, you want to prepare the bed and have a nice smooth top and get the plastic fitting tightly, smoothly over the top of the bed so you get a good cooking rate. You'll need six hot weeks or maybe longer. Um, what, uh, what I now do, which I haven't got a, as good a picture of, <laughs> is uh, we cut the plastic, old hoop house plastic, to be the right size, to, and we lay it over the bed. And then we have two people, each with a spade, starting at one end. And uh, if you step, if you put the spade near the edge of the plastic and step on it, it doesn't cut the plastic, it pushes it down into the soil. And if two people move along in concert, uh, you'll be able to keep the plastic flat, not wrinkled like we have in this photo. And you'll need six to eight weeks. Here are my books, Sustainable Market Farming and the Year-Round Hoop House and uh, the resources. These are all on the handout. They're also here, but I'm not going to read them to you. Thank you very much and uh, goodbye from me. I hope this has been useful for you. Fait que c'était la fin de la présentation. Euh, J'inviterai tout le monde qui a des questions à les poser maintenant dans le chat. On va prendre un bon euh, 20 minutes à 30 minutes si nécessaire pour répondre aux questions de tout le monde. Donc, allez-y maintenant, ça va être plus facile pour nous de, de trier par après que s'il y a plein de, de questions qui s'ajoutent au fur et à mesure. Um, Pam, I see you're in online. Can you press star six to access your microphone? Pam, can you hear us? Um, I can't hear you. You can hear me? Yes. This is Pam. Wow. <laughs> magic. <laughs> Super. Um, yes, magic. Yes. <laughs> So there's a lot of thank you on the chat. Everybody, I think, is uh, appreciated a lot of uh, your presentation. Um, oh, lovely. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. nice so for people to say so. Yeah, and people don't have access to their phone. Unfortunately, I'll be the only one and my colleague to to talk to you. Um, the first, uh, so I'll, I'll talk in French for just a second. Uh, donc, yes, à, à tout le monde qui est euh, dans la qui écoute la présentation, j'aimerais vous demander si vous souhaitez qu'on traduise les réponses des questions que Pam va donner ou si tout le monde est à l'aise en anglais. S'il y en a qui souhaitent qu'on traduise les réponses, juste écrire, euh, écrire oui dans le chat puis on va, on va traduire. Sinon, on va, on va laisser Pam répondre en anglais sans traduction. Oui, OK, parfait. Donc, ma collègue Stéphanie qui va courageusement ouvrir son micro puis son, euh, son vidéo. Yay! Allô, Steph! <rire> So Pam will be, um, will be, uh, I'll be asking the questions, I will hear your answer and then my colleague Steph will translate them uh, in French for everyone. That's right with you? Good. Perfect. So a uh, first question we had, um, so I'll try to navigate through. Okay. The first question we had from uh, Geneviève is, um, could you 
tell us more about uh, irrigation in cold climate. Do you do you irrigate in the winter months or not? And if so, what's the what's your schedule? Yes, uh, we use drip irrigation in the winter. Maybe once a week is enough. And we have, I don't know if you have them in Canada. I, we didn't, they are um, hydrants which drain themselves down after you close them. So they're frost proof. So we okay. use, we use one of those. So we don't have to worry about everything freezing. Okay, perfect. Steph? <laughs> oui, euh, ben, en gros, elle disait qu'ils utilisaient le, le goutte à goutte une fois par semaine en hiver, puis ils ont un système qui permet de drainer euh, toute l'eau qu'il y a dans les gouttes à gouttes pour pas que ça euh, freeze, ça, ça gèle. Ça gèle. Ouais. Euh, je ne sais pas trop c'est quoi le système, par contre. Là. Je ne sais pas si... Ouais. Ben, nous, à l'INAB, on a une valve anti-gel pour tout le système d'irrigation, mais on n'a pas nécessairement des, euh, quelque chose qui, euh, qui vide le, le, le drip, là, mais c'est intéressant. Ouais. Um, prochaine question. So we have someone. Yeah, we have uh, Marie-Ève who was wondering, Pam, if you were only using raw seeds or if you were also using pelleted, encrusted, or treated seeds, and what was your general strategy to optimize uh, germination and establishment in your in your hoop house? Um, we have used a few pelleted seeds, the new kind of lettuce, which is the Uh, Salanova kind, um, but they are a bit harder to germinate because of the coating. But we have used them. They're more expensive. Usually we buy raw seed. Uh, we don't use treated seed. Uh, our strategy is to um, sow shallowly, to water after sowing, and then to keep the surface damp until we see the seedlings. Perfect. And just to add on here, uh, could you tell us of your, like your strategy for pre-germination? Because it's a big question here. Um, how long oh. do you soak them and how long do you, I, I, you, I heard you put them in the fridge for a week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is this especially is for spinach because we want to sow the spinach in early September when the hoop house soil is too hot. And so we pre-sprout the seed. It, yes, in the fridge, uh, it's the best conditions for spinach. Um, we soak the seed overnight and then um, in the morning, drain off the water, fit a lid with a mesh, and then lay the jar on its side in the fridge. And then once a day, just give the jar a little turn around. It's not like making bean sprouts. You don't have to keep rinsing and draining. Just turn the jar once a day. Or, you know, if you forget that, they still will grow. <laughs> okay, uh, but perfect. other kinds of seeds will germinate in warmer soil. Okay. Donc, euh, elle disait que, ben, pour répondre à la première partie de la question... Je t'ai oublié. <rire> ouais, c'est pas grave. Euh, J'ai pris des notes. Euh, elle disait qu'elle utilisait des, euh, des semences qui sont enrobées, euh, pas enrobées, pelleted, c'est en, en petite... Euh, enrobées. Enrobées, oui. Euh, pour la Salanova, mais que, bon, ben, c'est pas mal plus cher, puis aussi, c'est euh, plus difficile à faire germer. Euh, en général, euh, ils il utilisent des semences euh, non enrobées ou en tout cas euh, simples. <rire> euh, puis, euh, ils, euh, ils vont semer euh, très proche de la surface, donc très peu profondément. Ils s'assurent euh, de garder le sol euh, humide jusqu'à ce que la semence ait germé. Euh, puis ensuite, euh, Charlotte t'a demandé par rapport euh, à la technique là, pour euh, faire pré-germer dans le frigo. Euh, disait qu'il l'utilisait plutôt pour euh, l'épinard parce que quand on veut les, euh, en fait les, les, les transplanter euh, à l'automne, quand il fait encore trop chaud, parce que l'épinard aime plus des conditions fraîches, ben, elle va les faire euh, pré-germer au frigo. C'est les faire euh, tremper durant la nuit, puis le lendemain, on les, on les, on les draine, <rire> puis euh, on les met au frigo, puis on tourne à peu près une fois par jour. C'est un peu comme, euh, c'est pas exactement comme quand on fait germer des semences, on n'a pas besoin de leur apporter de l'eau à, à chaque jour, mais juste les tourner une fois par jour pendant une semaine. 
Perfect. Another one. Um, Pam, did you ever try putting compost or manure around the culture or in your hoop house in general just to increase temperatures? Oh, no, I have not tried that. There's information in a book uh, by Sean Jarnicek or some name like that. Bio. Mm, um, I can't remember, the Biointensive Farm or some name like that. Biointegrated, that's it. Biointegrated Farm. It's a good book. Okay, Thanks. super. Uh, donc, pour répondre à la question, uh, Pam n'a jamais utilisé, uh, n'a jamais fait d'essai avec compost fumier pour uh, augmenter la température uh, autour des cultures, euh, mais euh, il y a eu de l'information dans un livre d'un certain Sean, je ne me rappelle plus de nom de famille, euh, dans un livre euh, Bio-Integrated Farm, donc la ferme bio-intégrée. Parfait. Um, just to be sure, I think everybody, uh, so the, the question is, um, you talked about four degrees Celsius as when, uh, at the t as the temperature where the, the the growth stopped. Were you talking about inside the hoop house and was it the air and was it maybe the average daily temperature? Sorry, didn't quite get that. Yeah, it wasn't very clear. The hoop house for what? So you talked about the four uh, Celsius degree as the temperature where the growth oh, yes. of. Yeah. So was yes. it the it's average the daily? Um, it's not average, it's um, whenever the air is above that temperature, then the spinach, the lettuce, the kale can grow. So maybe it's one hour in the day, or maybe the next day it's three hours. It doesn't, it's not the average, it's whenever it's above the threshold. But as a, rule of, air. As a rule of thumb, when you want to, because you used it to subtract days out of your calendar, how do you? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, hmm, um, so me. Yes, I haven't actually done it myself because I, uh, really stuff you grows when it's ready. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you can see when it's likely from that website, Weather Spark when it's likely to be too cold. And so then you know, oh, those days won't really produce much growth. Okay, perfect. This is hard to explain. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine, you did well. <rire> euh, donc, pour répondre à la question, euh, en fait, c'est euh, dès que la température de l'air est à euh, entre 4 degrés Celsius, les cultures poussent. En bas de, cette, euh, en bas de 4 degrés, ça ne pousse plus. Euh, un peu en dormance, on veut. Puis, euh, c'est pas un, un, une moyenne, mais c'est vraiment dès que cette température est atteinte euh, ou dépassée ou sous. Puis, euh, on peut, elle se fie, en fait, pour calculer là, les, les degrés, ben, les degrés jours, les, c'est ça, le nombre de jours qu'on a de croissance. Elle se fie au euh, site euh, WeatherSpark, euh, où est-ce que ça dit que quand même, ça donne quand même une bonne idée de est-ce qu'on va dépasser cette température ou pas. Puis, donc, c'est chaque heure du jour ou est-ce que la température dépasse 4 degrés Celsius, on peut le compter comme une heure de croissance. So, a uh, question about Celtuche, is that how you pronounce it? I don't know. Um, the, the person is wondering, uh, she wants to harvest it either in the field or in the hoop house in November. Uh, she saw in your presentation that it resisted well to cold, but she was wondering a bit more about what is your schedule for it and how do you grow it? Does it really need to go to seed before you harvest it? Uh, can you tell us more about how you grow the Celtuche specifically? Um, I've only grown it one time. Um, people that I grow for don't so much like stem vegetables, sadly. So I stopped growing. But no, you don't have to wait for flowers. You can, whenever the stem looks big enough to you, you can harvest it. Okay. Um, elle dit que par rapport à la celtus, um, en tout cas, comment ça se prononce, euh, pas besoin d'attendre que euh, ça fleurisse euh, pour, euh, pour récolter la, la tige. Euh, ça dépend vraiment euh, des goûts des gens. Euh, 
Euh, c'est ça, certains n'aiment pas trop quand c'est trop fibreux. C'est vraiment personnel. Parfait. Um, so, us, here in Québec, we use the term P19 or P30 for the row covers. Do you use the same uh, thing in the States to describe the thickness of the row covers? Uh, yes, I. it does exist, yes. Uh, so, you want more like 30, not just 19. Okay, so you're using P30. It's about that, yeah. And do you use just one layer, multiple layers? Do you take them off and on every day or do you leave them on? Uh, we only put them on at night if it's going to be very cold. And then we take them off in the morning so that the light gets to the plants because the thick covers stop quite a lot of light. And we only use one layer. You could use two if it's extremely cold. <laughs> Perfect. Donc, la question concernait les couvertures flottantes. Euh, euh, ils utilisent surtout la P30, donc la plus épaisse, euh, qui, euh, qui, va être pour, ben, qui va être mise sur les cultures euh, avant la nuit. Puis, ils l'enlèvent le matin parce qu'en fait, c'est ça, comme a dit, c'est que ça, ça va empêcher la lumière euh, de passer. Donc, euh, ils mettent seulement une épaisseur, mais c'est possible d'en mettre deux euh, dans les climats qui sont plus nordiques comme les nôtres. Ça peut être une option. And Pam, could you tell us more a little bit about uh, your fertilization plan? What kind of fertilizer do you use? What quantity do you put? Do you have a... Yeah. Um, we use homemade compost and we use it rather generously. Um, the, the high temperatures and the high humidity mean that the organic matter in the soil gets used up really quickly. So we try to put lots back. We also do some cover crops. Um, this year we used sun hemp, uh, crotillaria. We've also used buckwheat, but that's very really quick. Doesn't <laughs> Also soybeans. Uh, in the warm weather, we, we use cover crops. Um, and then we pull them up and lay them on the surface of the soil and let them disintegrate. Um, but for, uh, for the compost, uh, we, we do it twice in the year. Before the winter crops, we spread compost over the whole surface of the bed. Um, we use about five wheelbarrows for one bed, the length of the hoop house. Uh, and then in the spring for the for the tomatoes and peppers we dig holes and we put compost into the holes and then we put the plant transplant so we use quite a lot perfect euh, la question était par rapport aux fertilisants utilisés. Ils utilisent euh, du compost fait maison euh, assez généreusement euh, vu que avec la température euh, euh, élevé, l'humidité élevée, ben, ça, ça minéralise euh, rapidement. Euh, donc, ils utilisent beaucoup de compost et aussi euh, des cultures de couverture, des engrais verts. Euh, J'ai manqué la première, mais le deuxième, crotalaria, sarrasin, soya, il y en avait une autre, euh, qui vont ensuite, euh, ils vont simplement les, 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 les tirer du sol puis les, les, les appliquer sur le sol, les laisser se décomposer. Euh, ils vont utiliser du compost deux fois par année, donc avant les cultures d'hiver, puis avant les cultures euh, ben, comme les tomates là, qui vont être implantées pour euh, euh, la pleine saison. Euh, elle met euh, cinq euh, wheelbarrows. Ouais, euh, <rire> tu as un blanc aussi, mais en tout cas, brouette, brouette. Bon. Brouette, ouais, c'est ça, brouette euh, par, euh, par euh, planche. Euh, puis, euh, c'est ça, il faudrait des termes. Je suis je pense qu'elle avait dit c'était quoi les longueurs de ces planches. Um, just to add on here, Pam, do you do a side dressing when you have multiple harvests or do you just fertilize once at the beginning of the autumn? We just do once, yes. And you don't, you have, a, you don't have a yellowed leaves or anything? Um, no, we do... Um, one thing that does occur to me is that 
with our tomatoes and peppers and squash and cucumbers, we just do those for a short time um, because we can grow them outdoors successfully. So we, we pull those up at the end of July. This will sound awful to you. Uh, we pull them up at the end of July. So they've only needed to produce anything from March through the end of July. So I think if you want to keep those crops through the whole summer, then side dressing would be a good idea. Perfect. Um, we have a few more questions here. Are you okay to keep on uh, answering, Pam? Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> Super. Yeah. So uh, another one is, uh, what do you think of um, heating the soil? For, uh, um, yeah. Yeah, we don't need to. We prefer to focus on crops which will grow in the conditions that we have and we get so much food, it's, it's fine. Uh, I don't really want to spend a lot of resources warming the soil, but in the resources of the presentation, uh, there's a Chinese greenhouses book and they grow warm weather crops in cold weather. So that might be interesting for you all to read. Donc, euh, concernant la, le chauffage du sol, euh, elle dit qu'ils n'en ont, ont pas besoin, puis ils ne veulent pas non plus euh, dépenser euh, des ressources euh, sur cet aspect-là. Mais s'il y en a qui sont intéressés, il y a un livre euh, euh, chinois sur euh, la sériculture, donc le la culture de plantes plus de climat chaud, mais en, en climat froid, donc en serre. <laughs> C'est clair. Merci. Um, and Pam, how do you acclimate? Mm, not sure of that word. How do you like mm -hmm. adapt your plant from the germination to the transplant in the greenhouse? Um, it, for the winter crops, we start them in the ground outside. We don't start them with any heating. It's actually better outside in September. So they then we just make sure to do the transplanting into the hoop house um, in the afternoon, not the morning. In the afternoon, when it will start to cool down and they won't be too shocked. Um, at the other season, For the tomatoes and peppers, um, we we don't really. We bring the plants from the greenhouse where we've raised them and we transplant them into the hoop house. If it's going to be cold at night, we use the row cover. OK. Donc, euh, l'acclimatation pour les plantes d'automne, euh, en fait, ben, c'est ça, ça se fait dehors en septembre. Puis pour euh, celles du printemps, euh, ils vont les transférer de la serre à la serre froide. Euh, puis, ils vont utiliser des euh, couvertures flottantes, là, dépendamment aussi des, euh, des températures extérieures. So, do you uh, have any uh, special tricks for dealing with the humidity in your uh, high tunnel? Do you have... Uh ventilation in any way? Yeah, we have uh, high windows in the ends and we open those in the morning as soon as we can um, to let out extra humidity and to bring in some fresh air. Uh, and then we open the big doors in the ends. Uh, we don't have the sides walls that roll up. We, we decided we wanted to keep things a bit warmer. We didn't want cold drafts coming in at ground level. So we don't have opening sidewalls, just the ends. And so we wait for the conditions to be, at, they don't have to be warm really, just daylight and sunny. <laughs> Euh, okay. Pour la gestion de l'humidité, euh, ils n'ont pas de roll-up sur les côtés, là, de côté levant, mais euh, ils utilisent plutôt des... Euh, en fait, ils, euh, ils ouvrent les, euh, les fenêtres euh, du haut, euh, puis ils vont ouvrir les portes, puis ils attendent que les conditions se... Ben, c'est ça. Enfin, ils font, ils font euh, un renouvellement de l'air euh, pour euh, sortir l'humidité puis ramener de l'air. 
de l'air fraîche. Euh, on a vu ça. Um, so, I think the, question, the next question is about when you said you started seedlings uh, in, the, in, your, uh, in the field or in your hoop house and then you transplanted them back. The person wanted to know um, where it was done, if it was done in the greenhouse and just a bit more about the technique. How do you do so? Um, the winter plants, we start them outdoors in September uh, in a, a raised bed. Um, we just sow the seeds directly in the ground and then we do have to cover with netting. We have a lot of insects at that time. So we cover with netting. We water every day just about. And then when the plants are big enough, we dig them up and um, transfer them, transplant them into the hoop house. Is um, it that season or, or the other yeah, I think the warm one? I think it was uh, in the, yeah, I think your answer is good. From, from what I understood okay. of the question. <laughs> okay, we can have another question if it wasn't right. <laughs> euh, donc, euh, c'est ça pour, la, pour les, euh, les cultures d'hiver. Euh, en fait, ils, ils, les transplants, ben, en fait, ils, ils, ils sèment dehors, puis les transplants, euh, ils vont les amener en dedans quand ils vont être assez gros. Puis euh, pour les, euh, les partir, ben, d'habitude, en septembre, ils vont les faire sur des planches... Euh, surélevés là, des lits surélevés, euh, puis ils vont les couvrir avec euh, des filets anti insectes parce qu'il y a beaucoup d'insectes à ce temps-là de l'année, euh, puis ils les arrosent une fois par jour. Voilà. Mm -hmm. um, Pam, we, uh, we have what we call here mini tunnels. It's about, it's a homemade structure about eight foot large by a hundred foot long. Do you have ever tried those at your farm? Um. I, not here. I've tried them in England. Um, so you have wire hoops or something, and then clear plastic. Yeah, I think I think they call them low tunnels here. Okay, and um, I mean it, it's a very small. Like you, you can't be um, you can't be standing in it. We're just wondering if no. you've ever tried it or if ever uh, if you like it or not. It is an option um, to get more. To get warmer soil and warmer plants, <laughs> to do um, one of these low tunnels inside a hoop house, and I think Elliot Coleman, for instance, up in Maine, I think, um, or down in Maine, from your perspective, uh, Elliot Coleman does these inside the hoop house. But in my climate, we don't need to do that. Um, I prefer to avoid those extra structures in the hoop house if I can because it just adds work to deal with the equipment. <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> uh, donc les, euh, les mini tunnels, euh, elle, euh, elle, en fait elle a fait l'expérience plus en, en Angleterre ou en tout cas il y en a en Angleterre mais on n'en utilise pas euh, en Virginie. Puis c'est vrai que ça permet de, de réchauffer le sol, puis ben, la température de l'air. Euh, c'est que Elliot Coleman au Maine ont fait euh, l'utilisation, mais eux, ils essayent de diminuer l'utilisation de structures supplémentaires. Je ne sais pas si elle a compris qu'on les mettait à l'intérieur de la serre. So you Donc. said, Pam, that in the hoop house, you didn't want to add on like a tiny tunnel just because it was too many things to deal with. Is that what you uh, answered? Yes. Yes, okay. I sound lazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like um, Donna Sires, uh, sorry. Yes, go on. It's so, all right. Yeah, I was just, uh, c'est ça, elle disait que dans la serre, elle n'est pas intéressée à rajouter uh, une structure parce que ça fait juste plus de choses à manipuler le, dans la serre. Uh, so, next question. Uh, you talked a bit about solarization. Uh, the person was wondering a bit more details about your method. Are you doing it just in section or the whole greenhouse in one shot? And what's your favorite moment for doing so in the in the year? Right. Uh, we've done it in sections um, because we want to use the rest of the hoop house for growing crops. Uh, you do need to have warm weather, so um, we've sometimes done it 
in August. August is good. <laughs> uh, August and the very first week of September is good for us, but um, it definitely you need to get the soil hot, so it's no good doing this in the winter. Perfect. Euh, pour, la... <rire> oui, bon. pour la solarisation, euh, ils, elles le fait en section parce que ben, ça leur permet de continuer à produire en serre. Euh, mais évidemment, on a besoin de températures chaudes pour que ça fonctionne. Donc, euh, en Virginie, ça fonctionne en août jusqu'à maximum première semaine de septembre. Ici, ce serait plutôt au juillet ou peut-être, ça dépend des, des années, mais euh, c'est ça, il faut des températures chaudes. So I think we're getting at our last question here. Um, what would be your best uh, advice for someone who wants to start uh, cold climate uh, cultivating in the greenhouse? Like what would be the major point to take into account? Like what's the biggest mistake or biggest challenge? Um, be sure to have two layers of plastic. It makes more, much more difference than One, be sure to choose crops which will thrive in the conditions you have. Um, remember to close the doors at night <laughs> and the windows. Um, uh, try different crops. Try, you know, small amounts of lots of different things and keep records. That's important. Um, write down when you sow. Uh, when you start to harvest, when you finish harvesting, uh, if it was good or not, take photographs. Yeah, learn from your experience. Donc, euh, les conseils qu'elle donne aux euh, bah, ceux qui se lancent dans l'aventure, euh, évidemment, euh, d'utiliser un plastique, un double plastique pour la serre froide, euh, se rappeler de euh, fermer les portes et les fenêtres à la nuit et euh, aussi bien choisir ses, ses cultures pour qu'elles soient adaptées à, notre, ben, à votre climat, euh, pour que ça fonctionne évidemment. Ensuite, euh, faire, euh, ben, commencer petit puis faire différents essais euh, et évidemment garder un registre là, de, de ce que vous faites, euh, les températures, les, les Bon, en fait, le temps que vous avez, que vous les avez semé, récolté, euh, prendre des, des photos, puis euh, apprendre euh, d'année en année là, pour euh, améliorer votre technique. Perfect. So, Pam, I think it was the, the end of the question. So, I thank you a lot for all of your time and your good presentation. <laughs> thank you. I mean, I would like to offer to be able to do follow-up questions. If, if you could I don't know how the, this would work, but if you could translate to English and email me or something like that, because I think I would like to try and be sure I really answered the questions that the people had. <laughs> and Perfect. Yes, of course, we'll, we'll translate yeah. that. Yeah, if people could contact you and then you could send to me and I could reply and then you have to translate it back again, <laughs> probably. Yeah. Oui, ça fait que Pam a dit qu'elle est disponible pour des, des questions supplémentaires si jamais il y a des gens euh, qui, qui ont des questions qui leur viennent en tête. fait que si vous êtes à l'aise d'écrire en anglais, euh, je pense que son courriel va être dans le, le, le document qu'on va vous envoyer. Sinon, vous pouvez me transférer euh, les questions par courriel, puis moi je lui transférerai en anglais à Pam. Uh, a last question, someone's wondering if the, the farm you work on and live on is open to visits or is it... Uh, closed? Um, well, yes and no. Uh, because of the COVID pandemic, we have um, restricted who comes to visit um, to people who are fully vaccinated against COVID. And uh, at the moment, we are only doing a three-week visitor period uh, for people who might want to live here. In the future, we'll probably start having um, one day visits again, but not yet. So Perfect. there's a Twin Oaks website, twinoaks.org. You can go there and read about it there. In Perfect. English. Mm. <laughs> Juste traduire peut-être pour ceux qui sont intéressés, euh, il, il, 
il était possible euh, avant la pandémie de visiter. Là, avec la pandémie, bien évidemment, il faut être euh, euh, totalement doublement vacciné. Euh, il va y avoir euh, des temps euh, pour visiter, mais c'est vraiment restreint. Puis, euh, c'est ça, aller voir sur son site Internet. Point out. Parfait. Donc, euh, c'est ça. Allez sur le PAM aussi, le site Internet personnel avec euh, des liens pour plus d'infos si jamais vous avez euh, plus de questions et tout ça. On vous rappelle que l'enregistrement va être disponible en ligne sur le site du CETAB d'ici quelques jours. Puis, probablement demain, on va vous envoyer le document avec les références. Sinon, il va y avoir un deuxième webinaire cet hiver plus technique sur, euh, le, réchauffement, ben, <rire> sur le réchauffement climatique, <rire> sur la gestion climatique. <rire> Euh, fait que c'est ça, rester euh, à l'affût. Puis euh, oui, visite des serres aussi le 16 décembre. Par contre, l'inscription est obligatoire, donc il faut aller sur le site du CETAB pour s'inscrire. Fait que merci à tout le monde. Il y avait euh, 170 personnes. On est bien content euh, que ça ait pu rejoindre euh, tout le monde. Puis euh, c'est ça, bonne chance avec vos cultures hivernales. <rire> Écrivez-nous si vous avez d'autres questions. Au revoir. Au revoir.